Good morning, everyone. I want to thank uh, Mary and the organizing committee uh, for putting together this great conference. And we're going to continue now with our intermission from borderline personality talks to cover another vastly understudied disorder uh, known as obsessive compulsive personality disorder. So my aim for today is to give you some insight into what these patients are like, uh, but also to provide some empirical data uh, comparing OCPD uh, with the disorder that is often confused with, obsessive compulsive disorder, or OCD. So I come to you from the OCD and uh, Center for OCD and Related Disorders at Columbia, uh, and I have a strong interest in, uh, in OCPD and have been working with these patients for uh, more than five years now. Okay, I want to uh, acknowledge my funding. It's a career award uh, focused on phenomenology, neurocognition, and treatment of OCPD, and I have no other conflicts of interest. So to start, I just want to remind you of the uh, criteria in DSM-4 for OCPD and give you some, some, a few clinical examples. So OCPD is an enduring pattern that leads to clinically significant distress or functional impairment that's marked by four or more of these uh, to get the diagnosis. Uh, it's a preoccupation with order, details, rules. Uh, these patients uh, will uh, be, uh, spend a lot of time creating lists, schedules, uh, being very particular about the arrangement of objects, uh, wanting things to be just so, everything in its place. Uh, there's a relentless pursuit of perfectionism uh, or the uh, going after uh, unreasonably high uh, standards. Let me just actually check that out. Um, and at the expense of uh, completion of tasks. And so they have run into a lot of trouble in school settings, work settings, because they're not able to complete uh, their work. Uh, there's an excessive devotion to work and productivity uh, at the expense of social and leisure time. So these patients will choose uh, work over social pursuits, um, and that causes um, relationship difficulties for them. There's also an inflexibility about morality and ethics. Uh, so these are uh, people that get, will get, some of my patients, uh, for example, have gotten really worked up about um, not understanding why other people don't recycle or about why people litter uh, and uh, things like that. So it's that issues of morality, ethics, values, um, they tend to hold very rigid stances and it can lead to conflict with other people. There's an inability to discard worn out or worthless items uh, with the the sense that these objects will be used in the future, which can lead to clutter in the living space and also uh, problems with others that they live with. Uh, a reluctance to delegate tasks uh, based on the, uh, the idea that others will not do it as well as, as they will. And so these are people that uh, would uh, strongly prefer not to engage in group work. They want to take control of the task and will micromanage others uh, or um, do all the work themselves. Uh, there's miserliness uh, towards self and others, and there's and what they describe as a painful experience of spending money uh, both on themselves and other people. Um, and then rigidity and stubbornness, uh, you know, which can uh, lend itself to situations such as uh, not being able to see others' point of view, um, wanting to take control of, um, uh, you know, of, of projects and plans, things like that. So uh, in various factor analyses of these criteria, perfectionism and rigidity often come out as the core features of the disorder. Some associated features, there's indecision or fear of making the wrong choice. And uh, you often will see this in patients where they are uh, conducting hyper research, excessive research um, before they can make a decision. So if they have to make a purchase, even if it's something as simple as a pair of jeans, there's a lot of weighing of the different uh, options uh, just to make sure they can get it just right. Uh, difficulty with change, any uh, deviations in routines uh, often it can be upsetting to them, can lead to uh, uh, anger, uh, et cetera. Hassles in their regular everyday routine can be upsetting to them. Uh, difficulties relating to and sharing emotions, and uh, clearly that will uh, lead to relationship uh, uh, difficulties. Anger outbursts when their sense of control is threatened. Uh, 
and procrastination, which is associated with their, their need for, for perfectionism, which, like as I said before, leads to problems in, in work and school settings. There's a picture that I, that I like that I think really nicely demonstrates this uh, fixation in terms of order and uh, you know, this wanting to have things just so. I would like to present a case example of OCPD, which I think uh, nicely demonstrates the criteria I just presented, and you know, the details here have been changed. Uh, so this is a, a woman named Betty. Uh, she's 30 years old. She's a married school teacher. She would not let anyone touch her book collection, was very uh, concerned about um, order in her home, but what she kept saying is that she liked it that way. She insisted that her husband get into bed first so as a way to make sure that everything in the apartment was the way she wanted it and that he would not disturb anything uh, after she went to bed. So she would actually and sometimes even tuck him in. Um, she was unable to, mo which says something about him, but that's another story. Uh, uh, she, would, she was unable to modify her routine of getting ready even when late. Um, she would refuse to allow others to help her do tasks, so this is that delegation problem I was talking about. She insisted on driving or walking a predetermined route. Even if they were on vacation, she would plan the streets that they would walk on the, and the specific um, order in which they would do things. Um, she liked predictability, uh, and that was very important to her. She was critical of shortcuts taken by others, and obviously this led to significant uh, conflict at work and at home. Because you may not deal much with OCPD in your, uh, in your research or private practices, I'd like to um, just dispel some misconceptions I'm often asked about. Um, so people often think that OCPD is rare, but in fact, it is one of the most frequently diagnosed of personality disorders, and uh, several studies have now shown it to be the most prevalent personality disorder uh, in the U.S. general population. And com community samples uh, have shown ranges of 1 to 8 percent. Clinical samples range from 3 to 10 percent. Some often will say that OCPD does not impair functioning. In fact, it's associated with uh, poor spouse and partner relationships, as in, illustrated by the examples I just gave, um, problems in social functioning, interferes in school and work productivity. In samples uh, with MDD, uh, the, the depressed patients with OCPD were at greater risk of suicide, um, uh, both in, increased ideation and more attempts. Um, and in, in a large study of um, the economic costs of personality disorders, um, OCPD was found to cause more total economic burden in terms of both direct medical costs and productivity losses than all other personality disorders except for borderline. Another misconception about OCPD is that these people do not seek treatment. And in fact, um, Several studies uh, from the, the Collaborative Longitudinal Personality Disorder study have found that patients with OCPD are three times more likely to receive individual psychotherapy as compared to patients with major depression. Uh, another, uh, other studies have found high rates of primary care utilization amongst these patients. And despite this greater um, seeking of treatment, uh, there's still no definitively empirically validated treatment for OCPD. It's, and getting to the point of the talk, um, OCPD is often confused with OCD, and some will think that it's a minor version of OCD. In fact, it is not a subsyndromal form of OCD, and as I'm going to demonstrate today, that the disorders are qualitatively different, and I'll also show you data to that effect. It's also thought that OCPD precedes OCD developmentally, and we also know that that is not the case because the majority of patients with OCD, uh, about 70 to 75 percent, do not have comorbid OCPD. So getting to the heart of the talk today, uh, I want to uh, talk a little bit about the differences and similarities between OCD and OCPD. Um, there is evidence for a relationship between these disorders, and so there's elevated rates of OCPD comorbidity when you look in OCD samples. So about a quarter to a third of patients with a principal diagnosis of OCD will have comorbid OCPD. When you look at the family history of OCD probands, um, 
OCD probands are twice as likely to have a family history of this personality disorder as compared to control probands. Um, there's overlap in the symptom presentations, and it can often be difficult for a clinician to discern which is which. And so some examples of this overlap, ordering rituals in OCD uh, can, can overlap with the preoccupation with order and details that I spoke about earlier. Uh, incompleteness is a phenomenon in OCD, which is a distressing, uh, uncomfortable feeling that things are not um, complete, or uh, it's often known as a, a just right feeling in OCD, uh, is very similar to what some patients with OCPD describe with regards to perfectionism. And then hoarding is another area of direct correspondence between OCD and OCPD. And the, the DSM, on, only guide the DSM gives is to, to code excessive hoarding or clutter in the living space as OCD. Uh, but the, the presentation is similar. Uh, so uh, traditionally, the clinical guideline that's been used to differentiate OCD and OCPD has been to look at the experience of the patients with the symptoms. In OCD, their symptoms are referred to as ego dystonic, uh, which means that they, they see the symptoms as intrusive or as distressing. Uh, the obsessions are thoughts that they do not want to be having, uh, but they, they can't, uh, the thoughts keep coming up anyway. In OCPD, they describe their symptoms as ego syntonic, uh, which means that they see their behaviors and their thought patterns as appropriate, as correct, and sometimes they even will uh, to, they can't understand why others don't see the world the way they do. Uh, so despite this confusion between the disorders, which no, now dates back um, you know, years and years, uh, the disorders have never been systematically compared. And so that's my, my aim today, and, this, and I'll be showing you data uh, from that. And advances in cognitive neuroscience now allow us to go beyond just description phenotype uh, uh, comparisons to, to look at domains of neural dysfunction. So the domain that I'm going to be talking about today as one way to compare the disorder is the domain of self-control. And one definition uh, that's been uh, posited for self-control is the ability to evaluate and subsequently respond flexibly in search of a specific goal or outcome under changing environmental conditions. And there are uh, th at least three dimensions of self-control and uh, that have been examined in the literature. Um, one is the ability to forego an immediate smaller reward in favor of a delayed larger reward, and this uh, is called delayed discounting. Um, another dimension is the ability to use available information to reflect on the consequences of actions, and this is sometimes called as reflection impulsivity. Uh, and the third is the ability to suppress prepotent motor responses, it's, uh, response inhibition or motor impulsivity. Uh, so today I'm just going to focus on number one, which is delayed discounting, and propose that as one way to differentiate these, these disorders. And so there's been a large literature base that have looked at disorders marked by impulsivity across these dimensions, and, but what is sorely lacking in the literature is a study of conditions that are marked by excessive control. And so I propose that OCPD is a, is a model of excessive control, and so that's why uh, I was really interested in looking at this, uh, this dimension. So one of the, the best studied um, paradigms within self-control is delayed discounting. And it's been, um, it's been imaged in uh, uh, healthy controls. Uh, we know that preference for uh, the uh, delayed reward is associated with activations in dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. We know that preferences for um, immediate rewards are uh, associated uh, with activations in the limbic regions. Um, so there's been a lot of work that's been done in healthy controls, and uh, it's, it's been used uh, now even in psychiatric samples. Uh, so delay discounting yields, the, the tasks of delay discounting yield a, a discount factor, which is an index of one's capacity to delay reward. And so the higher your discount factor, uh, your greater capacity to delay reward. Uh, the discount factor has been shown to be stable over time. It's a trait-like feature. Um, and greater delay discounting has been associated with impulsivity across disorders. So in substance use disorder, borderline personality disorder, 
uh, pathological gambling, ADHD. All of these have been associated with uh, uh, less capacity to uh, delay reward. So in the study, we, we had 100 people uh, in, uh, divided in, into four groups divided by principal diagnosis. Uh, 25 OCD, where they had no history of OCPD, 25 OCPD patients with no history of OCD. Uh, there was a group that had both OCD and OCPD, and then a fourth healthy control group uh, that had no current or lifetime DSM-4, Axis-1 or 2 diagnosis, and no family history of OCD or OCPD. The the procedures, uh, just to review uh, quickly, we, we did a clinical interview, it was very, a very thorough interview, uh, as well as both SCID1 and SCID2. Uh, did an estimate of IQ based on standard uh, reading tests. Uh, the Yale-Brown Obsessive Compulsive um, Scale is a measure of OCD severity. We had a self-report measure of obsessive compulsive behaviors, uh, which uh, gives dimensions of OC behaviors called the obsessive compulsive inventory revised. The Hamilton was used for depression rating. Uh, the quality of life, enjoyment, and satisfaction questionnaire uh, was used as index of impairment quality of life, and then global assessment of functioning. The measure of delayed discounting was the inter intertemporal choice task, which is a measure of capacity to forego small immediate rewards, uh, which we call smaller sooner rewards for larger uh, delayed rewards, which are known as larger later rewards. And so I'm going to give you now um, an idea of what the, the actual questionnaires look like. So there were, there were two conditions, one in which the smaller sooner reward was presented first, and then one in which the larger later reward was presented first. Uh, and so this is the delay condition. Uh, so there are a series of binary choices. So they were offered the opportunity to get a gift certificate today versus a gift certificate in three months. And the discount factor was determined based on where they made the switch from, uh, in this case, uh, smaller sooner to larger later. So in this example, this is a person that would be considered over-controlled because they are comfortable with a very small margin between uh, the immediate versus the de delay reward, and they made that switch right away. Somebody who uh, tends to favor um, yeah, so somebody uh, who tends to favor uh, like uh, awards in the uh, in the immediate would would make that that change uh, later. So so anyway, where they make that that change is the indifference point, and that is what's used to uh, to calculate the uh, uh, the discount factor. So in the accelerate condition, it's the opposite, where the larger later reward is is presented first. Um, and then again, we're looking to see where they make that switch point here. This is a person that makes the switch um, towards the bottom of the questionnaire, uh, indicating that even though the um, amount um, that's offered in three months is only $2 more than what they would get today, they're still uh, willing to, uh, to, to make that switch. All right, so the discount factor then is an index, like I said, that um, uh, indicates the capacity to delay reward. Uh, it ranges from zero to one. The scores that are high, closer to one indicate over control. Scores that are closer to zero indicate impulsivity. And so um, scores closer to one indicate uh, that the person is, uh, you know, is comfortable with uh, delay uh, or has a greater capacity to delay. Those, those individuals uh, are are able to um, assess the present value of a reward as closer to its numerical value. Whereas on the impulsive side, those uh, individuals uh, tend to choose the immediate reward. All right, so let's look at the data then. So we had, again, the four groups of 25 each, uh, and they, the groups were, were well matched in terms of age, education, uh, gender, uh, race. There also were no differences in IQ, marital status, household income, or employment status. In terms of clinical characteristics, the two OCD groups did not differ in terms of OCD severity. Uh, the, the two groups that had OCPD did not uh, differ in OCPD severity, which was the number of clinically significant uh, OCPD symptoms from the SCID2. There was no difference uh, amongst the patient groups in depression severity. Uh, and what was interesting to us was that the, 
the patient groups also did not differ in terms of quality of life. Uh, and this is a meaningful finding because as I was noting in the misconceptions, people often assume that OCPD is not associated with impairment, but this suggests that these people had equal impairment and quality of life as compared to people with OCD. So some of, some of the other findings, on clinical interview, OCPD subjects, uh, those without OCD, did not endorse obsessions, but reported ritualized or methodical behaviors. Uh, and so, so this is a, a, a core phenotypic difference uh, between uh, the conditions. On the measure of, uh, of dimensional uh, ratings of OC behaviors, uh, people with OCD were more likely to endorse washing and obsessing, and people with OCPD were more likely to endorse ordering and checking. So here's the, the um, key neurobehavioral finding. Uh, what, we, what we have show here is that uh, there's a, a distinction between OCD and OCPD in terms of their capacity to delay reward. So the groups that had OCPD, whether or not they had comorbid OCD, uh, were, had higher discount factors indicating uh, you know, a greater capacity to delay reward as compared to OCD and controls. And there was no difference between OCD and controls uh, on discount factor. So this, this excessive control or uh, excessive uh, self-control was only shown in the groups uh, that had OCPD. And what also was interesting is that this higher discount factor was associated with greater OCPD severity uh, and poorer psychosocial functioning. So some, some conclusions. First, we found that OCD and OCPD are both impairing disorders. Uh, so I just indicated before that both groups uh, were equally impaired in terms of quality of life. And the scores on quality of life in this study were comparable to other studies of OCD uh, in terms of the, their, their poor quality of life. Uh, we also found that OCD and OCPD are marked by ritualized behaviors. Uh, they, they both showed these, these compulsive-like uh, behaviors. Um, although in OCPD, uh, the, the behaviors or the, compuls the compulsive behaviors are not in the service of um, you know, warding off harm or um, preventing some, some feared outcome, which is the case in OCD, uh, those behaviors were um, more likely to be, uh, like I said before, egocentric and uh, because they, they wanted it that way. Uh, the, the disorders are differentiated by the presence of obsessions. You don't uh, tend to see intrusive thoughts in, in OCPD as you do in OCD. Uh, and in terms of the capacity to delay reward, OCPD exhibited in increased capacity to delay reward as compared to OCD and healthy controls. And so this is an indication that uh, OCPD uh, is a, uh, a disorder of over-control. Uh, these, these findings are opposite uh, to other studies in, um, in, stu in disorders like borderline personality disorder, ADHD, pathological gambling, uh, and substance use disorders. Um, the findings here in OCPD are in line with a recent study on anorexia nervosa where they also had a higher um, tendency to de delay reward. So it suggests that self-control can be seen as a transdiagnostic continuum um, in line with the, the RDOC thinking uh, where you have uh, over control on, on one side and impulsivity on the other side. But the important thing is that both extremes of this continuum are associated with pathology. And so some of the, these findings may indicate um, some abnormality in reward processing in over control disorders and, and needs to be further examined. Uh, it also gives us a sense that perhaps there are brain relationships in OCPD, a disorder in which it ha which has not been imaged uh, and there's been no study of neural substrate. So it gives us a sense of where to start to look in OCPD that perhaps looking in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex may give us some insight into uh, what's happening uh, in the brain. It also gives us some new treatment directions uh, to examine because there are biological ways uh, of uh, lowering one's self-control. Uh, there are also psychotherapies uh, that focus on flexibility, uh, which uh, would be uh, important to examine in OCPD. 
So some, some future directions would include studying other dimensions of self-control uh, that I mentioned earlier, like uh, response inhibition, like reflection impulsivity. Uh, there are also newer versions of the delay discounting task, which uh, are now computer-based that allow for more uh, options in terms of money amounts and, uh, in, and also in terms of the amount of time between immediate and delayed reward. So it gives us a better sense of the indifference point. Uh, so in, uh, finally, I just want to conclude by saying that this is the first empirical data separating these two disorders that have so frequently been confused. Uh, and it suggests that OCPD uh, can be a model disorder of excessive self-control. And it's an area in which I encourage further study. Thank you.